up. I just want to tell you something. You're beautiful, and you are a beloved child of God, each and every one of you. And just look around that room, and just look at the beauty that God has put in this place. Somebody got a haircut. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for being here this morning. Welcome to the Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let's just take a moment for prayer. Lord God, thank you for the rain, but thank you for that bit of sunshine that we had. Lord, just fill this room with your light, your love, your glory, as we bring praises to your name. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's stand together and, and sing, sing a song.
Carolyn in the monitor, please. I, are you guys hearing her? Okay. Sorry, we kind of need the melody. Are you hearing me? <laughs> you can have a seat for a moment. No. Am I on? There we go. Good morning and welcome to Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're glad that each and every one of you is here with us today. Um, we hope that you have that joy in your heart uh, of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, it's January. It's a new year. And I'm grateful to each of you that's made the decision to be here and start the year with us. If you're just visiting for the first time, we want to extend a, a warm welcome. And uh, we pray that you will feel the love of Jesus here and the community of, of fellowship that those of us who have been here a while feel. And uh, if you're watching online or if you are uh, watching this later, we also want to invite you to come and, and fellowship with us. A um, couple things I wanted to point out. Hopefully you've all received the church bulletin. And um, there'll be things that you might want to look at from time to time in the bulletin that'll come up, that'll give you some idea of some of the things that we do as a community of faith. And we'd like to invite you to participate with us in getting to know God intimately, the opportunity to fellowship and loving each other selflessly, and then sharing the good news boldly. So those are kind of our, our mission here, and we hope you'll participate in that. There is one thing that I wanted to highlight in your bulletin, and I'm trying to find where it is. I apologize. It's on the, the back in the middle. And uh, one of the things that we have been doing, Sarah's been doing, is a sewing and craft hour. And I believe, is that monthly? Have we been having that monthly? Monthly, okay. So if you'd like to learn to sew, if you never knew how to sew, or whether you know how to sew and would like to have fun hanging out and sewing, um, either one of those would be great. We'd love to invite you to come to that. Uh, the next one is Sunday, January 15 at 2.15. And where is that, Sarah? In the Rose Room. All right, and Sarah's your contact if you have questions on that. We do it twice a month, first and third Sundays. Thank you, Sarah, for leading out. It's an important skill, and it's an opportunity to gather and, and share, so we appreciate that. One of those blessings that we were talking about in Sabbath school. Yeah. All right, so at this time, we'd like to give you an opportunity. There's a lot of people maybe you haven't met or you haven't seen. I want to invite you to just please stand up and uh, say hi to somebody, greet them, wish them a happy new year, and uh, happy Sabbath.
Okay, let's stay standing. <laughs> Keep the energy level up.
So we'll throw another man. new one at you. Oh. This little man in the front is amazing. If you guys want to look over here, wow, he really gets into if it. If we all <laughs> adopt his energy, oh my, <laughs> what a celebration.
seated. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. Matthew 5, 21 and 22, and I shall be reading from the New International Version. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to the judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to the judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be subject to the dangers of the fires of hell. Don't think it's working. All right, at this time, uh, we're, we're going to invite you to join us at, in the Garden of Prayer. It's our opportunity to lift up our petitions before our Heavenly Father. If you have something that's especially heavy on your heart this morning that you'd like to lay down at the foot of the cross, I'd love to invite you to come up and kneel with me, or if uh, you're more comfortable assuming a posture of prayer where you are, either in your chair or kneeling, um, please join us as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning it is our privilege to come before you with thankful hearts for a new day, a new life that you've offered us today. Father, it's a new year and a new opportunity lies before us. We want to thank you for the gift of life and health that we have. We know that some may be struggling with some of those issues of their, their health. Father, we want to lift them up. We want to pray for those that are struggling in that area. Uh, Father, we want to thank you for this church family. We want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to, to grow in our knowledge of you and in community and in fellowship together here. I thank you for each person who's here today. Father, I, I just want to thank you for our pastor and uh, for the miraculous way that you brought him back into our fellowship and into this church. And I just thank you for the ministry that he has here and for the way that he is blessing our church as your spirit flows through. And Father, I just pray that you'll be with him as he brings the word this morning. And I pray for each person who's come forward, Lord, that uh, you know the request of their hearts, you know the desires and the needs they have. I pray that we will lay down those things that trouble us, that stress us, that weigh us down as we reach to you with open arms and open hands, that you will fill us with your spirit, that you will fill us with your love, that we will be a light set on a hill in this community that will reveal your love to this town of Santa Rosa. Father, we know that the time is short. We know it's your desire to return to earth and take us home. We want to be ready, and we want those we love, and we want those around us to know and be ready as well. So help us to be the men and women that you need us to be to reach this community with your love. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Hey, I am on. Good morning. Before our deacons 
service this morning, I, I'd like to share with you a story that I heard, gosh, when I was young, just a couple of years ago. Um, and it was a story that impacted my life so much that I, 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 thought, I thought that I'd like to share it with you this morning. It was a story about a woman, a young mother, and her two children that were displaced from their home uh, because of a war that broke out in their country. Um, and they found themselves walking for days to find a place that was safe enough away from the fighting. They um, found this place along with you know a few hundred other people. It was a, a makeshift refugee camp. Not the kind that you see tents where you know, outside countries would, would provide resources. They were pretty much on their own. Um, and so the resources were very, very few, and, and they found themselves, this mother and two children, found themselves had lacking food. They had pretty much used up all the resources that they had, all the money, the jewelry, everything that they had to pay for food. The last thing that she, she used were, were her sandals. That was the price of the last meal that they had. So out of desperation, this mother decided to leave her young children with a friend that she had just met at this camp so she could walk miles to the closest city, to the nearest city, where she would beg for food. And so as she walked to this city, um, she started thinking about the events of, of the last few weeks, how she had met some people, a group of people. They were strange. For some reason, they found them, she found them to be happy and hopeful. They talked about a God who created her and them and, and saved them. They talked about a God who wanted a bright future for them, that prepared a mansion for, for them. It, it was really strange, a strange topic, but she found hope in it. And so she started thinking about the stories that they shared with her. They, she told, she remembered a prayer that they taught her. She didn't know what a prayer was, but they said that this God who they called Father answered prayers. Really interesting, she thought. And so she started reciting this prayer over and over again as she walked, just to forget about the hunger pangs that she was feeling. And she said it over and over again. And finally, one time, as she was saying these words, she was interrupted. She, the prayer went like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then all of a sudden, she heard a voice, you woman, what do you want? And she found herself um, standing in front of a food merchant. And again, the man said, you, what do you want? And the woman said, look, my two, two children and I have gone for days without eating. Um, and I've come here to beg for food. Um, and the man said, look, we don't accept beggars here. Surely you must have something to trade. She said, no, I, I've run out of money. I run out of clothing except what I'm wearing, jewelry, everything that I own is gone. The only thing I have, this woman said, is a prayer. And so this man thought, you know, I'm going to play along. I'm going to play along with this. Here, write, write your prayer on this piece of paper, and we will put it on one end of the scale. And if it's heavier than any of the food items that I put on the other end, you may keep that. And, and so she quickly wrote her prayer, put it in the scale, on one end of the scale, and the scale tipped ever so slightly, just tipped, just ever so slightly. And then this man grabbed the smallest potato that he could find and put it in the, in the bucket on the other end. And the scale, actually what you might think would happen, tipped that way, but then reset again, favoring the side of the piece of paper. So this man thought, that's strange. So let me get some more potatoes. And he grabbed a handful. Same thing happened. Started filling it up with all kinds of food, some vegetables and some fruits. And still the same thing happened over and over again. Finally, he filled up the bucket with potatoes. And because nothing changed, he decided to cut his losses and grab a bag and put all the food in the bag and gave it to this woman and told her to leave. As this woman was walking away, this man is, walking, is watching her just carry this big bag of food behind, really dragging it behind her. He was, 
he, he was surprised and astonished, and he grabbed a piece of paper, opened it up, and read her prayer. And it went like this. It says, Father, please give us our daily bread. You know, God wants us so much to trust in him. It is, it, we were talking about this in Sabbath school today. He wants us to just have faith that he will always provide. And he wants to reward our trust with blessings in abundance. There's a text in the Bible that speaks of this two points, trusting and blessing in abundance. And that's found in Malachi 3.10. See, Malachi 3.10, when I was growing up, it was used as a way, look, when I was growing up, Malachi 3.10, when I heard it up front, spoken by someone with gray hair like myself, I, I thought, okay, here it comes. The church needs money, and my wallet's about to get lighter. It was, it was always that way, and, and from your laughter, I believe you probably heard the same thing. Malachi 3.10 is not about, it's not about the church. Malachi 3.10 is for us. If God wanted to support this church financially, he can on, all on his own. He, he created silver and gold literally out of nothing. He owns a cattle of a thousand hills. He doesn't need a few nickels in my bank account to support this church. Malachi 3.10 is a divine mechanism that God wants to use in order to spoil us. Did you guys get that? Malachi 3.10 is God's way of wanting to show off to us by spoiling us. And that's why... He wants Malachi 3.10 to be part of our daily lives. He wants it to be consistent in our lives. That's why the, the, the terminology behind it, he's daring us. Malachi 3.10 is worded in such a way that God literally saying, I dare you, test me now, prove me now. In fact, there's a translation that, said, that makes it sound like this. He says, make me prove it to you if you are faithful with your tithes. I will open the windows of heaven and pour upon you blessings in such abundance you will literally will not have any room for it. That's what Malachi 3.10 is for. God wants so much to bless us, and sometimes we get in the way. But this is God's promise, and it's a promise for us, and God always keeps his promise. At this point, our deacons will serve us, and I'm going to invite all the kids to come up um, as as we receive our um, our story this morning. Jennifer Rich will be telling our story this morning. Now, uh, adults, of course, you haven't forgotten that you're giving money for children's ministries as well. I, I don't see enough hands raised. Ah, there we go. That's more like it. All right. That's... Children, they're raising their hands. Take their money.
Nintendo riches. Where the Russian river is large, the sky even larger, and God is the largest. Okay, so here is my thing I want to tell you today. All right, so a little while ago in the summertime, my children and I and husband Rich, we moved. Now let me see, my children, um, they're about your size, your age right here, but they used to be your age. And someday, if the creek stops rising, they'll be your ages. So we packed up our stuff, we moved to Rio Lindo, and the move was very long from Southern California, and the road was long, and then we get to Rio Lindo, and all of a sudden, there we are, and the gates open. Now, in the Bible, in Revelation, you, they talk about some gates. They talk about some pearly gates. Well, I'm not saying it's the same thing. However, from my time at Rio Lindo, I have found that it feels like hallowed ground. So here's the thing I want to tell you. And you can suddenly find these stories where real life starts making you think about bigger things like heaven, like hallowed ground. All right, so I have a story like that for you today. But this story started yesterday, actually, at Redwood Adventist Academy. So, does anybody here happen to go to Redwood Adventist Academy? Raise your hand. Yes, a couple. So then one of you please volunteer to tell, just keep your hands right up there, volunteer to tell me what the story was about yesterday. Just a quick synopsis. Synopsis, synopsis, synopsis. Come in to get it. Uh, Audrey, what was it about? Um, no, just a word, give me one word one that word. it was about. Certain things made you happy and certain things didn't. Awesome. Excellent. Yes. Rio. Excellent. What else? What else? There was a main character from Rio. A main <laughs> character. That's not me. What? Oh, then never mind. Here we come. I hope this one knows. Skunk. Yes, indeed. We had a story about a skunk. And I'm so glad that you guys remembered the bigger part. So what's interesting about this is hearing what you guys remembered about it. And I love that. Because what we remember about stories actually reveals things about ourselves. So we had a skunk. And what happened with the skunk? It sprayed you. Exactly. It sprayed me. This big, bad not so big, but a bad skunk. It was my enemy. It made me so angry. The skunk sprayed me. So I was very angry with the skunk. <laughs> now here's the thing. What do we do with our, like when we're angry and we have enemies like this skunk right here, what do we want to do with it? Yeah, something like that. Maybe we might be so angry that we just want to do away with it, huh? It's possible. I'm not saying it's going to happen. But something might happen to Skunky, except here's the problem with the skunk and I. Yes. I'd like to hear your input. Kill it. Oh, no. See, and here's the thing. That is our first impulse because skunks have this sticky stink. It's awful, the sticky stink. I'm telling you, it's awful. And one time, so I have experience with skunks. My children, if they happen to be here, would be able to tell you the story. One of them, when I got sprayed with the sticky stink, was nowhere to be found. He was over there yelling, oh my goodness, what is that smell? Get away from me. And he wouldn't even get in the car with me to go home. It was dreadful. I felt so bad. And I was angry with the skunk. But here's the thing. This same, this same child who was, wouldn't come around me when I had been sprayed was also with me when we found some little baby skunks. And it was, they were baby skunks that were even smaller than this one. And all of the family had died 
like all of the babies had died and the mama had died and there was, it makes me so sad even now, and there was one tiny little baby that was still alive, but barely. So the same boy, oh, I gave away the gender. The same boy who didn't want to go anywhere near me with the sticky stink was the same one who said, Mom, we have to help it. And so we did. We got that tiny little skunk, and it wasn't as dead as we thought or near death as we thought because we put it in a box, and it escaped from the box, and it crawled up inside the car's chairs. So it was in this seat, and of course, what do skunks do when they're scared? They spray. Luckily, it was a baby skunk, so its spray wasn't as sticky or as stinky, but it still sprayed. My red Prius never smelled the same after that. <laughs> but we saved that tiny little skunk's life. We took it to a rescue where they helped it get healthy. And then the end of that story was this terrible fire came, and I wondered about whether the skunk orphan had made it. And the lady wrote this news article, and the very best part of it was when the skunk sprayed the fireman. <laughs> <laughs> as, they were, as they were helping him. So I just want you guys to know, sometimes what might be our enemies may be, could be more a fear thing or an anger thing, and there may be a bigger story than that. The other thing I want you to know is that, this part makes me cry a little, but I want you to know that God is not just at Rio. Because God did not just take care of the Rio skunk. Those, it was a family of skunks living in our garage, and it stayed. They all stayed there until they chose to leave because we couldn't bear to do anything weird or mean to it. So I want you to know that God isn't just at Rio. God is with you everywhere. And every story that you have um, in your life has some part of God in it. So I hope you guys start gathering your stories and telling them. And also, if you want to, 7th through 11 grades could come to Academy Days at Rio, February 24 through 26. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. Are you getting anything out of here, up here, up here? Well, it's so good to see you. Thank you for worshiping with us here at the Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want to just call your attention to a couple things while I create a little bit of space for myself. I'm trying to lose weight here in the new year, so I need to move a little bit more. A couple announcements for you. The first is next week, we're going to have a special music program during our regular 11 o'clock church service. The 7th uh, and 8th graders from Redwood Adventist Academy and some of the music groups from Rio Lindo Adventist Academy are going to be here doing a joint music program during the worship service. So if you are able, assuming we haven't all washed away into the Pacific Ocean... Would love to see you here to support those students as they share their talents with us and lead us into worship of the Lord. Next Sabbath, please. Second thing I want to call your attention to is if you are looking for a little bit of extra food, there is produce left over from our food distribution program in the Rose Room right behind the stage after the service. Go in there take whatever you'd like. It's not going to keep until our next distribution. So please take advantage of that. There's some Brussels sprouts, some onions, some apples, potatoes. And you know what? If you find anything else in there, take that too. <laughs> Last announcement. It's the new year. It's a happy new year for many of us, I hope. But I, for one, am ready to stop looking at Christmas decorations. <laughs> so if you are like me, would love to have, invite you right after the service to find Keith Francis up in front, and we're going to move some of these trees off the stage. It's not going to be work on the Sabbath because so many hands are going to make that work so light that it will just be in a fun activity. All right. The final thing I have to do is conduct a little bit of church business. Last week, we had a first reading for the Tan family. Danny, Denise, and Lily Tan, very sadly, praise God, they followed his leading to Florida. 
uh, and, and have only faced, you know, hurricanes and, and all kinds of tragedies since. So we're hoping that brings them back. But they are, we are, they are transferring their membership to Tampa. So is there a motion to accept that transfer of membership? So moved. I appreciate the somber tone. Uh, I heard a, a motion in a second. All in favor, please say amen. amen. Any opposed, please say the same thing. Amen. Oh, all right. I, I, I'll take the opposed, too. That's noted. That my, that's my daughter. <laughs> that motion is carried. We are continuing to explore together the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus begins to, in the Sermon on the Mount, help us see the law of God, God's ways as he sees them. And so that's really what we're beginning to step our way through. We're learning to understand God's ways through Jesus' most famous sermon. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've been thinking a lot about my wipers lately, my window wipers on my car. I, I have discovered that there is something about my car wipers that makes me angry. It's one of the reasons I realized I cannot be a passenger in the rain, because I cannot stand poorly timed window wipers. I can't do it. If, if you are driving a car and your wipers are flying back and forth in a light drizzle, how dare you? How dare you? It, I, it, it's offensive. It drives me bananas. If you are in a downpour, and this is obvious, and your wipers are going slow, get out of here. I can't take it. For me, I am neurotic about my wiper speed. It's got to be just so. And if you're ever riding the, in the car with me in the rain, I am constantly adjusting to the, the, the smallest variation in precipitation so that the wipers are just getting the right amount of water away and allowing the right amount of water to collect. It's a problem I have. I know it's true. But it just makes me so angry to see ill-timed wipers. Anger is at the heart of Jesus' message for us in the book of Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. But whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put into prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus is proposing a total transformation of how we relate with the people in our lives so that the world might be changed. The first thing that we need to sort of pick apart as we understand what Jesus is asking of us is what in the world Jesus has going on with the law. He begins, you have heard that it was said, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Jesus is addressing the sixth commandment. If, you, if you're familiar with the Ten Commandments, these, these ten words of God, their directions, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, remember, honor, all of that stuff. Jesus is addressing the sixth commandment, and I, I'll tell you, at first blush, it seems to me that Jesus is saying, it used to be said this way, 
But now I'm saying to you something different. One could almost imagine that Jesus is contradicting the Old Testament, contradicting the Ten Commandments. In fact, if you are a, a, a any at all familiar with Christian history, this section of the Sermon on the Mount is called the Antitheses, which is to say that, that it, it's pictured historically as Jesus undermining or changing the law. I would suggest to you that that is not the case. In fact, this is one of the times that we get in trouble when we don't read Scripture in nice big chunks. Because if you were here last week, which, believe you me, if you've forgotten what I said last week, you are not alone. But if you were here last week and happened to remember what was said, we read verse 18, just a couple verses before this, where Jesus said, not a dot, not an iota, not a single letter of the law will be changed until the end of all eternity. So is Jesus saying it will never be changed, not for all of eternity, and then literally in the same talk, on the same moment saying, except for all the things that I'm about to change right now? No. What is Jesus trying to do? What is this about? I would suggest to you this morning that Jesus is delving into the underlying intent of the law. That when God placed the Ten Commandments before a struggling and straggling band of recently released slaves, God was offering a hedge against the worst of human behavior. And Jesus is now starting at where the Ten Commandments begin and taking us further along the same path. You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder, but whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Jesus begins, I would argue, ooh, that's exciting, by affirming the first commandment, you shall not murder. Now, maybe for some of us here today, this is the message that you need to hear. You shall not murder. And if that's the case... Let us know so that we can go to lunch early. <laughs> Probably not a commandment we're going to get a whole lot of argument with, right? Not a lot of people who are out there saying, I don't know. God, really, you're stepping on some toes here. Murder is really culturally important to me. Now this, this feels accessible, doesn't it? This feels like something most of us can get on board with. Jesus affirms it. Yes, I really do mean, Jesus really does mean you shouldn't murder people. Great. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. In other words, Jesus is saying, I suggest that the same way the same universal way that we process the, the concept and the unacceptable nature of murder, we ought to process anger. Now hold on a minute. Jesus. Is Jesus allowed to do that? Anger is important, isn't it? Has he met a Dodgers fan? Where's, where's Phil Catalan? We love you, Phil. <laughs> is Jesus allowed to do that, though? I mean, that's a big leap, isn't it? From murder to anger? Like, I, I'll be honest, I can't think of many people in my life who have broken the sixth commandment. Like, I don't have an exhaustive list of people in my contact list. I don't have a Gmail group that I email regularly that are predisposed to breaking the sixth commandment. You know, murderers. I, I, I don't have that. Maybe you do? That's interesting. Let's talk about it. But I do have a long list of people who I know get angry. In fact, I have a long list of people that I know I anger. Am 
I supposed to think of those parties as the same? That's a, I, I think it, it deserves a moment's pause to, to really reckon with the extreme nature of that claim. That, that Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Murder, we all agree, yeah, murder, not a good idea, murder. Anger, equally, fully in every way, not a good idea. Worthy of the same judgment. That's a strong statement. I, I would even confess to you, and I know this is going to take you aback, because even though the text here doesn't refer to wipers, just brothers, there have been times in my life that I have been angry with things other than car accessories. Th this scripture is saying that you should look at me and consider me the same as if you would imagine a murderer is on stage. Talking with you about scripture. And this is a heavy concept that Jesus is putting forward. The Ten Commandments pay murder as sin and say no. Thou shalt not murder is dealing with the outward reality. Jesus now presses within and suggests that indeed anger is the trunk from which murder branches. Anger of mind and word, now Jesus casts into the same Paul as murder. Jesus is addressing the inward reality. That these two things are one and the same. That what is true within is and should be considered simultaneously as true without. He's saying the kind of world that murder creates is precisely the same world that anger creates. This is the argument Jesus is putting forward. And it is a confrontational one. That that. Holding that feeling of anger, of even speaking with anger, you fool, that it is deserving of the same judgment. He, he even goes as far as to say, you will be liable to the hell of fire. I want to stop for a moment. I'm going to give you a, a quick, free Seventh-day Adventist theology bullet point. Because Seventh-day Adventists, we don't believe in hell which may, may appear to be very problematic because I just read a verse where Jesus said, well, if you do that, you're going to hell. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, now does it? How could we believe that there is no hell, and yet we read Jesus saying, you'll be liable to the hell of fire? Language is an interesting thing. In, in in English translations, the, the word in Scripture is almost universally translated as hell. It, it's translated that way because Christians for centuries and centuries have thought of what Jesus is referring to here as hell. The place you go when you die and you are bad. Jesus, you will not, not be surprised to, to hear, did not utter that day on the hill the word hell. Uh, English, a less commonly spoken language in Jesus' day. Just a couple thousand years from invention. Jesus probably didn't even speak the word that is used here, but maybe he did because it's a Hebrew word that, that in fact is being translated. It's this word Gehenna, which means ge in Hebrew means valley. Henna means Hinnom. It's In fact, Jesus is saying the name of a place when he's speaking here. That, that if you are angry, if you speak in anger to, to someone, that you are liable to Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom. The valley of Hinnom, if you were to look at a, a map of ancient Jerusalem, is the dump of Jerusalem. Outside of Jerusalem's walls, there was a valley, and everybody took their trash there. And there, the trash was burned all the time. And so when Jesus is, and indeed when Scripture is referring to hell, it's not referring to some kind of 
cosmological theological concept of hell, but rather it is using the imagery that people are familiar with. You're going to go where the trash goes. You're going to be burned like the trash. And not a single person imagined as Jesus was saying, aha, just like the trash that burns eternally and never stops burning. We know that kind of trash. No, Jesus is referring to the place where you take the trash and it burns, and once it's gone, it's gone. So what is Jesus trying to say? This, I, did I say this was going to be a 60-second theology point? Boy, someone should throw something at me. Jesus is telling us that judgment leads to destruction, an end, just like it did for every other piece of trash in Jerusalem. Jesus is saying that if we live in anger, like if we are a murderer, we are deserving of disposal like trash. Sometimes it's good to be uplifted on the Sabbath, isn't it? Jesus is revealing to us that the underlying brokenness of the world that leads to murder is not transformed by the restraint of humanity's ugliest outward tendencies. That, that to simply not murder does not fix anything about the world that leads one to murder. Jesus is pressing further in and saying, no, no, no. That which leads to murder, we ought to imagine and understand is as the same, is as deserving of being cut out and destroyed of our lives as the act itself. And so he, he brings us to anger. Jesus concludes the passage that we're reading by talking to us a little bit about what we should do with people who have reason to be angry with us. In, in, in essence, Jesus says, come to terms quickly with your accuser. While you're going with him to the court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the garden, you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Jesus is saying that when we are wrong, we have to acknowledge it. We, we shouldn't try to use a worldly justice system to put it right or worse to get away with our wrongs, but rather to make amends directly as much as it is possible to put wrongs right. Jesus is saying, don't do what everyone else does. That, that rather than facing those we have done wrong to and doing our best to put it right, don't do what everyone else does and try to get around it. Try to get away with it. In fact, Jesus makes us a promise. You won't. In Hebrew literature, that is the literature of God's people of the Old Testament, there is this literary format, this literary device. Sort of like today how we might think of uh, maybe... Poetry. We understand that in poetry, things are written and delivered in a certain way to communicate ideas about what is being written. Right? We understand in other ways that when you're reading a paper or a newspaper article, that there is, at the very beginning of that article, the most important information is going to be delivered to us up top, right? Right? And, and, and then at the end, in conclusion, we're going to get the most important information reiterated to us at the end. That is common communication in English and in many other languages. The book of Matthew that we're reading in, it was written from a Hebrew mindset. It was written using the values of literature that that people had. And one of those values is something called a chiastic structure. In, in Hebrew, the most important part of, the, of a passage was not the beginning of the passage or the end of the passage, like it might be in an English work. 
that in a chiastic structure, the most important part of the passage is right in the middle. That, that indeed, that the passage at beginning and end is sort of pointing itself towards trying to emphasize what is at the middle. In the middle of this particular passage, we read this. If you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. This is where Jesus turns things up to 11. Jesus is, is using the imagery of sacrifice, of the altar, to try to communicate something very profound. That indeed Jesus is trying to say that as difficult as it is to wrap our minds around dealing with anger the way that he suggests anger should be dealt with, he's not even saying that's where we should stop. That, but that, that we have a further ways to go beyond just trying to deal with anger or even get rid of it. Jesus talks about the gift at the altar. The, the gift was surely, in the mind of everyone listening on the side of that mountain, some kind of sacrifice. There, there are many sacrifices outlined in Scripture. Maybe it was a, a certain kind of bird or perhaps a, a spotless lamb. Sometimes it was as simple as a grain or oil offering. Uh, often, as we covered just a few weeks ago, there was salt involved in the offerings as well. But Jesus is saying, leave your sacrifice at the altar. The, the picture would have been a rich one for the people of the day. Jesus is talking about the most important form of worship for them. There was nothing more important than the sacrifice brought to the altar. That was what it, was all, it all came down to. The, the way that I got good with God in Jesus' day was I brought my gift to the altar, and there it was offered in the right ways with the right contents, and I was good with God. Jesus is saying, the most important part of your faith, whatever is most highly valuable to you, you should set it aside. You should leave it at the altar. You should abandon it. If you remember that your brother has something against you, if there is something between you and someone else, even the most important part of your worship, that which you have invested in, that which there is countless scriptures directing you towards, you should abandon it and go be reconciled. First, be reconciled. <coughs> Jesus is talking about worship. It's an interesting word. It's really a, a compound word. Worth-ship. Worship is that which we ascribe worth to. <coughs> worship is diverse. I ascribe worth to things by investing in them. Financially, I ascribe worth, worth to things by investing in them emotionally, like how I've been praying for the 49ers. <coughs> I ascribe worth to things by posting about them on Instagram. I ascribe worth to things by, by, by investing my time in discussion of them. Here, sacrifice is put into the place of the ultimate form of worship. But I would suggest today that we ought to consider what are the most important forms of worship for us. Maybe it is coming to church on Sabbath, giving an offering, singing a song, hugging a friend, listening to some guy talk through lunch. Maybe the most important form of worship for you is something that is private. It's a morning devotion or uh, singing along with a song in the car. Maybe the most important form of worship for you is not even religious in nature. That's the thing about worship. Everyone does it. Everyone worships. Maybe politics are your worship. 
You've invested time and energy in following the, the most minute details. Maybe business is your worship. And that is where you have put the most worth in your life towards. Maybe a relationship is your worship. But Jesus is making an important claim. I would suggest to you an, a claim that goes beyond religion. Jesus is speaking to the world, and he is saying that there is no worship. There is no worship that is more important than that of reconciliation. It's uh, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday this coming Monday. And one of the most famous sermons that Martin Luther King, or Martin Luther King Jr. offered was a sermon called Loving Your Enemies about this exact passage that we're studying today. He delivered it in 1957, about 10 years before he was murdered. And it seems appropriate to share a couple of his thoughts about this passage, about anger, about murder, this weekend. This is what he has to say in reflecting on the passage. There is a little tree planted, he says, on a little hill. And on that tree hangs the most influential character that ever came into this world. But never feel that that tree is a meaningless drama that took place on the stages of history. Oh no, it is a telescope through which we look out into the long vista of eternity and see the love of God breaking forth into time. It is an eternal reminder to a power-drunk generation that love is the only way. It is an eternal reminder to a generation depending on nuclear and atomic energy, a generation depending on physical violence, that love is the only creative, redemptive, transforming power in the universe. So this morning, Luther says, as I look into your eyes and to the eyes of all of my brothers in Alabama and all over America and over the world, I say to you, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. And I'm foolish enough to believe that through the power of this love somewhere, men of the most recalcitrant bent will be transformed. And then we will be in God's kingdom. We will be able to bless those persons that cursed us, to even decide to be good to those persons who hated us, and we even prayed for those persons who despitefully used us. Jesus, this is now back to a more common preacher talking. Jesus is in fact himself the ultimate sacrifice. He is saying that when we allow anger and broken relationships to endure, we are in fact abandoning him on the altar he placed himself on our behalf. It is there that Jesus is mending our broken relationship with God. Reconciliation, Jesus is saying, is more important than worship. Or, if you prefer, reconciliation is the most important worship that Jesus is earnest for. Jesus is, in fact, positioning right relationships as the most significant act of worship we can offer God. Jesus is saying that we should not just be changing our outward relationships in the sense of not murdering, we should not just be endeavoring to change our inward reality, that of anger and, and how it comes out in word and thought, but rather Jesus is saying to look to the cross, to follow me, is to place right relationships with others, being reconciled, even against people that we are angry who hate us, being reconciled even against people that we have angered, that we hate, 
is the most important act of worship. Jesus says it clearly. First, first be reconciled to your brother. This is challenging. And I think it is for us as a church, as individuals, to be confronted with this difficult truth. Whether we are Christian or no, whether we are part of this church or no, Jesus is saying there is no difference to God between murder and a broken relationship. They are one and the same. Who is the person that you have, even within, even through the state of your present relationship? Murder. For that is what Jesus is suggesting. Jesus is suggesting that what transforms this world is when people imagine that anger and disunity between me and someone else is akin, should be treated like it is the act itself. It is an uncomfortable thing. It is, in fact, the, the very pinnacle of what people say, oh no, Jesus, he's, he's getting rid of the law. <laughs> the law is easier than this. The law is easier than this. This is the hardest thing. May we, like Jesus, look at those who treat us with this, this, this who despise us, who treat us with hate, and instead choose sacrifice, sacrifice of our own selves, in favor of even the opportunity of right relationship with them. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you because sometimes you truly challenge us with the height of your call. That you are not satisfied with people who simply restrain their most base desires. You are not satisfied with people who do their best to get rid of, of emotion like anger. But Lord, you are calling us to something more. You are inviting us to be in step with you towards something more. Towards the very kind of relationships inspired by, informed by you that have been transforming the world since the cross and will transform the world until your return. Be with us, we pray. Forgive us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. than just me and you, Bill, but
Happy Sabbath. First, in Jesus' name, be reconciled. God be with you. Amen. keep you till we meet, till we meet again. Have a happy Sabbath, everybody.